it's not difficult to reduce a supracondylar if you know what to do. Problem is the pattern, the fracture pattern and the combination is what tricks you. Second is the swelling, how to tackle the swelling. Third is how do you assess stability so that you get an optimal result. Fourth, you should understand what is blocking reduction. And fifth, your technique. So everybody has his own technique. Standard supracondylar, this is a type 6 year old with a type 3 injury. Now what is the problem? As Jayanth has pointed out, rotation is not acceptable because of the column concept. Unless both the columns, the medial and lateral columns and the pillars are sitting on each other, it tends to collapse into varus. Right? So the rotational malalignment is not for the rotational deficit that you will develop, but the co varus collapse which happens. Column views are very useful to check the reduction and the quality of reduction so that you know that it is not going to sink into varus and collapse into varus and create a deformity. So I have written and spoken about this enough number of times, audio. So we'll just play that video, a small video again. And I'm presenting to you our arm board technique for close reduction and pinning supracondylar fractures in children. We have no disclosures, there is no commercial support or any funding for this video. Conventionally, supracondylar fractures are reduced and pinned in the following positions with the elbow on a hand table where sometimes manipulation of the distal fragment becomes quite difficult and after that pinning requires a free axis around the elbow and the table actually comes in your way and the drill keeps on hitting that while passing the KY, so it's quite tough. You can use another method where people keep the elbow on the CR tube itself, but the cleaning solutions can seep into the CR equipment and can damage equipment and cause problems. Some people do reduction and pinning in the lateral position, but getting an orientation of varus and valgus is quite difficult when the patient is in the lateral position. You need an assistant for traction, counter traction, and when you need to see the lateral view, you tend to externally rotate, which causes the reduction to sleep. So we have our own way of doing this supracondylar reduction, which we will demonstrate. This is a preoperative radiograph of a type 3 supracondylar with a brachialis perforation and a pucker sign. That's the ecchymosis as it is seen. This is the picture of the arm board. It's simply a wooden board of about one inch thickness, which is radiolucent painted with a simple oil paint and is about four feet in length. Preoperatively, always check the capillary refill. Now the arm board is positioned thus that the proximal fragment is strapped with a transport or a hypoallergenic paper tape. The distal fragment is off the table of the board and with a gentle milking maneuver, we can reduce the fracture. You can see that pucker sign disappear. And you can see that the distal fragment is completely free and it's outside the board. I do an AP check and confirm my coronal plane alignment. And then we make the CRM rotate by 180 degrees to look at the lateral profile. I don't need an assistant because the tape provides counter traction. I can reduce the fracture. I can check a true dead lateral in this position. And this allows me complete 360 degree access opening after appropriate preparation and deceptive lotions are applied and draping the first pin is passed through the fossa in the lateral profile with the elbow flexed maintaining my reduction i pass the first pin from slightly anterior towards posterior and that goes through the fossa which is the four cortex pin then i turn the c arm by 180 degrees to look at the ap confirm the position of my pin and the second pin is now placed parallel about eight millimeters away from the first pin through the column. So we have a column pin and a fossa pin and you can see the ease with which I can do the procedure without any real assistant or traction counter traction. I can then rotate in external rotation to confirm rotational stability which you can see is very good and then I take obliques the internal and external oblique views to look at column position. Then I bend the pins and cut the pins, leaving a centimeter out for extraction later comfortably. After which 
we remove the draping and a cast in the comfortable position of about 70 degree flexion at the elbow is done and always finish by checking the capillary refill post operatively thus the supracondylar pinning can be made very easy and you can achieve consistently results like these extremely easily without any damage to equipment without any assistant we've been doing this method for over 15 years and i've had excellent results in case of difficulty in reduction joysticking is also possible with this and we can just push the arm board a little further if i need to do an open reduction from the anterior approach thank you very much for your kind attention so this is what we've been doing and uh, i'm sure a lot of you have, are already practicing this about pinning pin placement has evolved from cross pinning now to more of lateral pinning because of the problem of iatrogenic ulnar nerve injury uh, the cross pinning was thought to be more stable but again as i said the litigations as documented in us by far are because of uh, iatrogenic ulnar nerve injury so if you can avoid it totally it's better lateral pins are safer more convenient and now have adequate stability they they were thought to be less less stable but the configurations that we use today from lateral pillar pins we talk about a four cortex fossa pin which goes through the olecranon fossa and in case you need skags has published that you can use a third lateral pin to give adequate rotational stability so what is this four cortex lateral pin one of these pins has to go from the lateral condyle come out through the olecranon fossa perforate the fossa again and come out on the medial side so this gives you actually a four cortex strength and rotational bending stability and one is through the column so that you don't end up having any kind of instability and you don't need to really do a medial pinning the direction of pinning is usually the lateral pins are lateral going slightly from posterior anterior to posterior because the tilt of the distal humerus is 40 degrees anterior and the medial pin has always to be from antero medial to posterior lateral because of the ulnar nerve so that is usually the direction you will still need to do medial pins sometimes and when what what are those indications after your lateral pinning if you find there is rotational instability you will add a medial pin if you have an oblique fracture where the fracture pattern the lateral condyle is lower lesser and the medial condyle is larger you will obviously need to put a medial pin and when you have a impacted like jayan showed you the medial impaction or the medial impacted uh, type 2 or even type 1 unless you correct that impaction you will not get uh, a adequate reduction and you may need to pin that so this is an example of a very large medial fragment you can see that the medial fragment is very big here and passing only lateral pins is not adequate so we have to use a cross pin here how do you do a safe medial pinning even an ulnar nerve sheath impingement in the medial pin can cause a palsy because of the rotatory movement of your uh, drill so late palsies have also been described so it's important that you pin in extension you must remember that your lateral pin is already in position so there is relative stability extend the elbow so that the ulnar nerve falls backwards and enter anteriorly you can walk the k wire on the bone don't drill directly with your hand you can walk on the bone and make sure that you feel the medial epicondyle and then put your drill on and drill from antero medial to posterior lateral you can put your thumb on the ulnar nerve and push it behind while you are doing this so that you don't hurt your anybody when in doubt you can always make a small opening feel the medial epicondyle feel that there is no nerve always use a drill sleeve so that the sheath doesn't get entangled and then pass your wire so that is an example standard fixations as i said cross pinning if you are going to do cross pinning the crossing of the pin should be above the fracture for adequate stability rather than at the fracture site and the medial wire has to be anterior to posterior two lateral pins has become the standard of care where the divergence should be at least 8 mm one should be through the column one should be through the fossa this is the four cortex wire which gives stability that is how the wire has to pass if there is requirement of a medial additional pin you can always add that and an additional dorgan spin has been described from proximal to distal if you want to avoid the medial pin from distal to proximal and uh, impinging the ulnar nerve but there is always a possibility that you might hit the radial nerve when you are going very proximal 
So try to avoid that too. So actually the first talk ends here, but since Taral is not here, I'll carry on, Premal. Yeah? No, we'll finish the reductions then. I think uh, we should move on because otherwise we won't finish in time. Yeah, so we'll just go through all the difficult because the next talk by Taral, who's operating, was on difficult supracondylers. What I spoke was standard supracondyler. So the difficult supracondylers, this is an example. Premal has given this case to me, medial cortex comminution, treated in a plaster and ended up with this kind of a grotesque deformity. So that is something that should not happen. Uh, Jayant has already spoken about type 2 medial combination, both of which have been adequately demonstrated. There is this box classification which also talks about the patterns of fracture, a low supracondylar, a high supracondylar, an oblique supracondylar. Every fracture is not transverse and you need to look at obliquity also. So this is an example where you have an oblique supracondylar with a large medial fragment where medial pinning is mandatory and that needs to be pinned. When you have a large lateral part, you can do only lateral pins. Transverse is usually stable, but you can on the lateral have an oblique fracture pattern, which may be rotationally unstable. So even the lateral view, you need to look at it very critically. What is the obliquity of the fracture? Is it likely to slip off? And then pin it accordingly, depending on uh, how perpendicular is your pin to that. High supracondylars, again, are a difficult problem. This is an example. And high supracondylars, they have now described that you can pass an intramedullary rod one pin is going to be bicortical, but one pin will in essentially go intramedullary. This kind of configuration is difficult. So one pin on the medial side or the lateral side will have to essentially go intramedullary if it is very high because you cannot engage the opposite cortex. Especially with comminution, you will need to go really high like an elastic nail or intramedullary rod. That's the configuration. Very low supracondylars, you should be very careful about when you pin because you can get avascular necrosis. And this is a complication of the disease, not the treatment. But if you identify a very low supracondylar, your job is to counsel the parents that this needs follow up because you can end up with a problem and not worry about having litigation later on because they think it's because of your surgery. Adolent supracondylars, again, are more severe and may have to be treated like adults. Uh, essentially, there might be large pieces and only K-wire fixations may not be adequate. Yesterday, um, uh, you saw Venkat and uh, Manoj fix uh, a T-Y elbow. So this can heal, but you can have uh, fibrosis or bone formation in the fossa. And this kind of fracture with comminution fixed with K-wires can end up with bone in the fossa in the olecranon fossa or anteriorly which can block uh, your motion. So that may require a plating like an adult. So sometimes a supracondylar in an older age group do consider plate fixation instead of K-wire fixation. Multidirectionally unstable fractures are type 4 as described by Wilkins where the posterior and anterior periosteal sleeves are torn. So they can go into an over reduction when you try to flex them. So this technique has been published and described the use of a joystick. As you can see here, the extension type moves to a flexion type when you flex it acutely. So what you need to do is put a K-wire and manipulate that fragment and get it into alignment. Sometimes you may need to go intramedullary. And then once that is aligned well, then you pass your pins and have your stability. Use of a trans pin in the flexion type. Again, this is another method where this is Mandar's case where he has nicely shown a flexion type supracondylar. How do you reduce that? You put a K-wire going through olecranon, through the distal fragment, intramedullary. Right? So you do this, trans pin which is intramedullary and then you can adjust the mediolateral varus valgus on this single wire which is going to be just an aligner, it's able to toggle. And then you pass your pin medially, laterally as you deem correct and then you pass the second pin and remove the trans olecranon pin. So you use the olecranon and distal fragment as a single unit to extend and go intramedullary, achieve reduction, pin it and remove that wire. That is how you should do this. Irreducible fractures, you can use intrafocal leverage technique. You can use a T-handle and a K-wire to lever that fragment out sometimes if you can't get reduction, something like this, and then pass your pins. 
Sometimes you have a large hematoma in front and our friend Viraj has shown this suction cannula technique where you make a small nick anteriorly, put in a suction cannula, aspirate the hematoma and use that as a lever against which you will reduce the distal fragment and then pass your pins. So this is one more technique which he has published in 2005. Taral has shown us that if you get a delayed supracondyler, 7 days old, 10 days old and you still want to close reduce it, there is a way you can do it. This is after close reduction and the patient comes after 8 days with some abrasions and a displaced fracture. So what he has shown is that with a small nick you can put a small mosquito. Put a small mosquito forcep with its inclination downwards, go into the fracture and lever that fragment out which is anterior and get the reduction and then pass your pin. So this is the video, uh, it's not working anyhow. So that is just to demonstrate you can also use an additional K wire proximally to derotate the shaft fragment and all your difficulties will be solved so that you can do a rotational maneuver. That anterior spike like that which is not acceptable, the K wire there can be used to derotate and bring it into alignment so that you can pass your wire. So small tips and tricks here and there as, as to how to achieve excellent close reduction rather than having to do an open reduction and the configurations we have already spoken about. Thank you very much.